Okay, so thrilled to actually uh, meet Luke again and very pleased to invite him for this community meetup. Uh, Luke and I have been collaborating since I think just the very early days of uh, Zing Open Source. And uh, Luke is a lead uh, solution architect at Databricks, where he has helped uh, develop the solution accelerators of customer 360 and product matching. And he's given us a ton of feedback. He's uh, really helped improve the product so much. And he brings a, a lot of um, entity resolution expertise from his uh, prior um, job uh, history with Tamar. So in all, uh, it's it's just been a pleasure working with Luke uh, on various fronts, and I'm very excited to see what uh, notebooks he has for us today. So over to you, Luke, and thank you so much for coming over. Thanks, Anil, um, and thanks everybody for joining. I'm happy to be here and uh, to present some stuff to, to everyone today. Um, so yeah, as, as Sonal said, um, my name is Luke. I'm at Databricks. I've been here almost five years now. I'm a solutions architect, uh, which is for those in, who, under, who know the other names, like it's like a solution engineer. It's a pre-sales engineer, field engineer kind of role. I'm technically in the sales org, but I'm like the technical side of things. So I'm the person uh, that talks to people who are trying to figure out if Databricks is a fit for them, um, you know, or maybe they've already used it and they need some help. Um, I love to work on a couple groups of problems. I really like performance tuning. I like to go in deep on Delta and um, the different types of storage formats and how to how to really optimize workloads. And uh, and then obviously fuzzy matching and entity resolution is interesting to me as well. Um, I was originally a, uh, in academia. If you go if you go back far enough, I was a physicist uh, for a while and ran away from academia. Um, about 15 or 12 or 15 years ago and and cut my teeth on data at ab initio for for a couple of years ab initio is like this etl company uh, in boston kind of like an informatica in some ways and i was there for four or five years and kind of learned about parallel processing and um, was helping customers answer interesting problems there and uh i remember there was a there was a question that came in one day um oh so no sorry was there something no, sorry, oh. I mute myself. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no worries. I just wanted to make sure in case, uh, in case I missed the question. Um, there was a, a a customer's question came in one day at Abinitio, and it had to do with like trying to match data that didn't really match. And I remember thinking about it. I was like, oh, that's kind of a cool problem. And and probably like a lot of the people on the on the line or watching this, uh, you probably tried your first time solving it yourself, and you know, thinking you'll you'll do you know you'll do blocking or something, which you probably didn't even know was called blocking when you first uh, did this sort of thing. And I worked on it for a week or two with the customer, and uh, eventually uh, someone tapped me on the shoulder at Abinitio, and they're like, "Hey, you, uh, you should, you should have come to us first. And it turns out that there was a product there being developed. Um, uh, the name was Correlate, I believe, back then, and uh, and that was my introduction into like actual advanced approaches to fuzzy matching. And so I did that for a couple of years, and uh, and then liked it so much that I went to a, a company called Tamer, which is a, a MDM startup in the Boston area as well. And I kind of switched over to the post sales services side and was implementing um, projects and eventually leading a team there. And started learning a little bit more about the stewardship side. So I kind of understood the engineering side from Ab Initio, and I started learning about the stewardship side, like this whole golden records and the the need to have cluster IDs and to be able to do over uh, over uh, rides and rules appro approaches. And and so uh, that was great. Um, but then a couple of years, I started getting the itch. I, I started getting really intrigued by Spark. Spark was something that Tamer used under the hood. To do its fuzzy matching, its its engine, and I and we used it, but like I didn't get to play with it. I didn't. I would see stack traces, and I would have no idea what they meant. And I was like, well, why did this fail? Uh, and so I got really interested into Spark, and so I decided to go to Databricks, and so I've been here now for five years. And um and and that was 2020 when I started here, and by 2021 I was starting to hear about Zing. I had tried to build my own framework. Uh, at Databricks just as a way to kind of learn Spark and kind of do my own thing. And I started hearing a little bit about, about Zing and, and I started looking at it and testing it and thinking it was pretty cool. 
Um, and that brings me to uh, my my relationship uh, with Zing and with Sonal and the team here. So that's my intro, and I'd love to kind of walk you through some stuff that um, we've put together and a little bit of the story. But I don't know, Sonal, if you wanted to chime in with any thoughts. So that's that was how I I remember it. It was it's, I think it's been about three or four years that we've been um, working together. Um, yeah. What do you think? Does that sound right? So that's uh, I forgot uh, to mention the Avanisha story, but uh, that's even richer entity resolution, uh, you know, background. And I think uh, one thing that I found charming in this uh, little brief that you gave was that all the stack traces led you to Spark, <laughs> which is kind of funny and <laughs> interesting in its own ways. So I would say that ER obviously is is a tough problem, and I think as a physicist. Um, Surely you are drawn to some of the tougher ones. So now over to you to you know kind of work us through. We're just looking forward to that then. Yeah, yeah. Let me go right to the screen and start showing some stuff here. Um, okay. I'm I'm still happy to if anyone has questions. I mean, feel free to interrupt me. I don't mind. Um, but I will. Uh, I'll t tell you a little a little bit more history. Um, just real quick. I don't have too much more, but um, twenty like twenty twenty one, maybe like November twenty twenty one. I think is probably when Sonal and I started corresponding for the first couple of times. Um, I don't even remember what we talked about then, but I remember trying to imagine some kind of partnership, whether official or unofficial. And and it didn't take too long for us to get to something pretty cool. Um, August of 2022, we put out this first blog in Solution Accelerator, along with uh, two, two of my colleagues, Mimi and Brian. Um, and, and this was our first attempt. And and it got a lot of attention. It was really great. Um, I think the story was uh, was pretty interesting. You can actually tell this is pre uh, ChatGPT because there's not a lot of bullets and numbering, which you know I think nowadays you see blogs and there's a whole bunch of bullets and numbering, and you're like, oh yeah, someone someone used ChatGPT to write that blog. Um, but uh, but I think it, it really resonated and got a lot of attention. Um, I will say though that the accelerator, the solution accelerator, which if you were to follow these links, it would take you to these notebooks. It was really complicated in retrospect. Um, it may be because we were trying to be a little too complete. Um, we were we really tried to imagine an, an entire production workflow of how you would implement stuff and all the scaffolding and, and stuff you would need to build in order to actually have something work, we, it, in particular with like how you need to prepare data the difference between like this initial workflow of deduplicating a whole bunch of data and then kind of the incremental workflow of deduplicating smaller chunks of data as they arrive on a daily or more regular basis. Um, and and so it still has good stuff in it, but I think it's it, it was maybe not accessible to everyone in terms of its um, just the sheer number, amount of detail. Um, well, that was that was the first one and about almost a, exactly a year later. We released another blog, this time on products. And this was right around when 040, Zing 040 was getting released. And it was being developed uh, very aggressively uh, by the, the Zing team. And the kind of the, the two new things about this one, um, you can see both of them in this in this little picture here. Um, one is just the fact that there's pictures, images. Um, that's not as interesting. This one's more interesting. So the idea was that some people who are doing part mastering, um, they have images as part of their data, and they want to use that image similarity to help distinguish uh, potential parts from each other. And um, so that was something that got that that Sonal's team somehow was able to get in pretty quick, and we were able to show a, a concept of how you might use that in a pipeline. Um, but the second thing, maybe to note, if if you're not seeing it yet, is just the the UI here. Just there's a there's a box with data in it and it's comparing item IDs and item names and then there's pictures and then there's little buttons uncertain match and no match um, this was actually motivated by a notebook that I had been developing for years now um, just kind of working on it behind the scenes and whereas maybe these this blog and this blog aired on the side of completeness um, I wanted instead really to work on a notebook that was simple, um, uh, explained the message clearly, uh, and was distributable. Um, and that is what I want to walk through 
for the rest of the time, um, or at least the majority of the rest of the time. I now call this my Zing POC notebook. It's had several names. I've shared it on the Zing Slack channel or earlier iterations of this before, but this notebook is something that I send out, I feel like almost every week now to, to people at, uh, to potential customers at Databricks or existing customers at Databricks, really whoever wants to see it. Um, and and the goal again here it was not really to be to complete be to be complete but I wanted to send something to someone who, who if they worked at it could could get to the end of a POC in one week, and have a couple iterations of matches done and feel like they had answered some question uh, about the feasibility of um, how Zing might work on their data. Um, and so I maybe I'll pause just for a, a second, just in case there's any questions. But my goal, my goal today is going to be to kind of walk through the notebook. I, a lot of this will be familiar, so I'm it's, I'm going to speak maybe less on the Zing specifics uh, and more on um, wh why it was oriented this way, kind of more like the ledger notes and thoughts and behind the scenes ideas. But um, but any thoughts or questions, feel free to to let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to just keep going right through. OK. Um, so uh, if you've looked at some of the notebooks in the Zing GitHub, I think you'll probably start seeing some overlap. And honestly, I don't remember who created them first. I, I remember Sonal had a very early example of using Zing and Databricks. And I remember being initially inspired by that, but kind of building my own and then sending it back to her. And then she maybe updated her own. And then, I, I don't know, at some point, they're, they've overlapped a lot. I, I don't know who wrote them originally, but um, but but you'll probably see some similarities between them, uh, while also maybe seeing some new stuff as well. Um, so it starts by um, by trying to break down the POC into five steps. Um, really, only the first four steps are the ones that are, are mostly most common for a POC. Um, step five is sometimes something someone once in a very particular case. But the, the five steps are really just installation of Zing, um, a discussion on the data that you're going to use, a discussion on configuring Zing, and then a discussion on running Zing. Um, and if I'm ever in a rush, like if I have like 10 minutes to demo or sometimes even five minutes to, to demo to someone who, who's potentially interested, I almost always just skip to skip step four because you know step four is the interesting bit. It's, it's the active learning loop. And I, I often find myself trying to impress upon uh, my audience just how unique it is for a open source package or an option, uh, an option to have an open source package that runs on Spark, so is scalable, um, does probabilistic matching, and has an active learning cycle built into it is really unique. Um, I'm not aware of another one. Um, there might be others out there now, but uh, I'm not aware of another package that does this. And so I try to impress that upon any anyone that I'm presenting to. And I, I kind of explained that there's going to be this three part iteration loop. There's going to be finding what I call interesting pairs to label. Sometimes you edge cases, um, labeling those pairs and then saving those pairs. Um, and then you kind of make a decision. Do I do I move forward or do I start back over and do uh, one, two, three again? And now do I start over? Or do I go back to do one, two, three again or do I have enough? Um, but this iteration loop is is the smallest, tightest iteration loop in the process. Uh, and so I, I will sometimes kind of just skip right to that. Um, I think uh, as I walk through the actual notebook now, a couple important things just to talk about. Um, right, right here at the top, this compatibility is something that's the top of my mind, and I think Sonal as well. Um, it's not the easiest story, unfortunately, and it's gotten maybe a little trickier recently with some decisions made by Databricks and um, how that has left some some partners that that uh, use Databricks and Spark in the past. Uh, but hopefully there's a path forward. Um, in, in short right now, if you're if you have if you're interested in using the 034 Zing, I think your best bet is Databricks 12.2. It's a long term supported one. That means it has three years of support. Uh, we'll, we'll keep it supported and updated and patched. Um, for Zing 040, right now the best fit is 14.2. Uh, 14.2, unfortunately, is not a long-term supported version. That would be 14.3, but uh, Databricks Im implemented some pretty significant changes in 14.3 for third-party Spark uh, vendors. And so um, so we're still trying to figure out what to do there. Thankfully, it's going to be good for at least another six months or so, and uh, hopefully there'll be a um, you know something in the future that gives us a, a longer-term uh, runway. 
um, installing Zing libraries, I you know I walk them through it, try to make it as easy as possible, uh, just to to make sure it's it's very clear. Often people that I talk to don't even know what GitHub is, or well, they know GitHub, but they don't really know how to interact with it. They don't know how to download a jar file or download a gzip file and identify a jar file. So try to make that as easy as possible. Um, get to the starting data. So in this case, in my example, I use the the North Carolina voter data from University of Leipzig, I believe. Uh, and uh, I do mention some limitations. I try to be very, very honest and open. Every time I find something new, I add more to this notebook. But uh, the while I believe the um, enterprise version of Zing is compatible with Databricks Unity Catalog, the open source version of Zing is not directly compatible with Unity. And so in my demo, I still use Hive Metastore, which is what we had back in the day before Unity, for those who are familiar with Databricks. This is not a sales pitch for Databricks, so I'm not going to get into all that stuff. But um, there's some, there some compatibility stuff, and uh, I try to make it very clear things that do and don't work. Um, so in this case, I'm, I'm looking at North Carolina voters, and I try to, to point out like the likely transcription errors and mistakes in the data. Um, I've had some thoughts about maybe coming in and actually blanking out some of the data to simulate real data more. No, nobody has data that's 100% populated, right? There's always going to be missing data. Uh, I haven't gotten around to that yet. Um, go through the basics of installing and getting things or uh, configuring Zing. So, you know, pip install to get the, the Python uh, library in place, um, setting up your, your model directory uh, or your Zing base directory, and then the model that you're going to work on um, with some, some text to explain what we're doing here. Um, defining the input to Zing. This is usually maybe the next place that, that takes a little bit of discussion with anyone I'm presenting this to. Um, I, I have a demo in this case where I'm using a single data set. And again, my my goal here is to, to build a model and cluster all the data. So I'm trying to kind of do the idea of like throw all the records into a big bag, shake it all up, and then extract all the matches from it and put them into clusters. Um, and a lot of times I get asked, well, I have more than one source. Um, this might have been the very first thing I ever asked Sonal, actually, probably in 2021, was uh, what do I do if I have more than one source? Um, and there's really nothing stopping you. I, I have kind of the, the setup here. If you have more than one source, then you need more than one input pipe. And here's the method for doing it. Um, but there is there is the requirement that input sources must have the same schema. So usually I'll talk to customers about unifying your, their schema with a little bit of upfront processing. The terminology that I've been using recently is to imagine Zing picking up at the silver layer of the medallion structure. If if you are familiar with like the Databricks uh, view of um, of how data processing goes, and you have like the bronze, silver, gold uh, layers, um, I don't think Zing picks up from bronze. Uh, you you probably want to have a couple steps where you've ingested the raw data normalize the schema, a couple placeholder steps where you could come back and clean it up a bit. Um, but at some point you, you've unified the schema, maybe that's your silver layer, and now you can you can point all of your sources to Zing. Um, the next step is to define the output. So we all know you just you create another output pipe or create another pipe. This time it's an output pipe. Um, I'm using Delta as input and output, um, and uh, we can move on to maybe some more interesting stuff. Um, I I do enjoy going to this step. This is usually one of the steps that gets a lot of attention. Um, I I explain how we're going to match the data on name, suburb, and postcode. We're going to pass through the rec ID but not use it. And if we wanted to maybe change that postcode from from a fuzzy to a um, pin code, we totally can because. As we all know in the docs, you have a nice list of of different methods for matching, and this usually gets, you know, some internal oohs and ahs that you know you have some some flexibility here. Um, I do have a note here, and maybe this is a time that I can ask Sonal if there's an update here. But I remember um, in an engagement us finding that the order in which we specified the columns. Uh, to to Zing, so like I'm going to specify them in this order was important. And in, in fact, Zing maybe looked and gave more preference to things earlier in the list than later. I'm not sure if that's still true. I might need to change it if not, but but that was something that we had noted. And so I added it to the notebook. Um, yeah, so, so uh, yes, I think uh, your observation was right. And uh, this happens because the blocking tree is learned 
you know, we kind of iterate over all the fields. And if it finds a good um, a good block function or combination on the first uh, few attributes, that's where it kind of stops because blocking by definition is supposed to be not really very exact, but just be able to split the number of comparisons in a way that uh, the computation doesn't blow up. So that's something that um, uh, that I think uh, we we also kind of it's it's part of the code. It's still where it is. I have thought about you know making some kind of a random shuffle around the fields and trying to figure that out. So that may be some of the things that you know, we can kind of uh, we can try. So as as one of the next things that I'm thinking about in the coming uh, one of the releases for Zing is to come out with some of these experiments and you know let people try it uh, and then give us feedback on whether it's working better for them or worse. And I think that um, that's something that uh, will take community help in terms of whether they feel they're learning better in terms of um, a new algorithm on the blocking with some minor modifications, not really a whole new algorithm, but minor tweaks like the one Luke mentioned, and maybe uh, that works better in some scenarios. But as of now, uh, even our uh, recommendation is that if you have stuff which is better populated and more discerning and, uh, you know, like some stuff like SSN number, which are probably very clearly going to be unique or going to be matches across your records, you want to put them first. Yeah, good. Um... I love the idea of uh, crowdsourcing the feedback on ideas, and and I'll say that in pre-sales, I I always think of a, a good way to spin this, and so I I tell I tell people that this is a tuning knob, it's a it's a feature. Um, you get to you know you're always asked you know can you how do I tell Zing that one one field is more important than another? I'm like oh well thankfully Zing has a feature, and you just put them in order. But uh, but I think it's great to um to continue experimenting and and crowdsourcing that. I think you, um, before we move on, uh, Mayur yeah. is asking a question. Any limitations for number of columns provided in list? Uh, you want I to think the... That? Yeah, I, I would, I, well, I would guess, although so I'll correct me uh, if I'm wrong, that in general, the more fields you give, the more uh, compute power you'll need and probably the more training data you'll need. So I would say um, when customers ask me this, this I'm basing this on from prior experience at other companies as well. I, I recommend to start simple. So I, I say, don't just throw, uh, you know, everything at Zing to figure out, you know, across a hundred columns what to use. I, I say, you know, if you were going to look, you know, if a person was going to look at a couple records and decide if they're the same, what would be the most important signals to a, a person? The person doesn't have to tell me exactly what the similarities need to be, um, but the person would probably look at, you know, these seven or eight columns. I would say start with those. Um, and and I think the more you put in, you should anticipate the more training data you'll need in order to get better accuracy. But but Sona, what do you think? Yeah, I would agree there, uh, Luke. There is no limitation per se, Mayur, on any um, you know kind of columns or size of uh, columns. But um, uh, my experience looking at many data sets also kind of concurs with what Luke is saying, which is it's mostly seven to 10 or at max 12 columns, we see most people being able to figure out whether two records are matches or not. And uh, the general rule is to look at the most valuable columns, the ones that are best populated, and uh, ones which are not really the same. Like if, if your entire population is a state of California, you probably don't want to add in state as one of the uh, columns to match up. Yeah, that's yeah, distinguishing columns. Yeah, yes, right. Well, well populated, distinguishable. Yeah, columns, things that tell that that give good signal that two things are the same, um, rather than or or different. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Well, I I have a couple more kind of important parts to show through here. I think one is is a new take that I have on the performance settings. So. Um, in, in the Zing docs, it, it's always talked about num partitions and label data sample size. Num partitions is, is going to be used whenever there is a distributable part of, of uh, Zing, which is mostly going to be like the match, the training and the matching step. Um, and, and the idea here is to, is to set it to something 
a factor of 20 or 30 bigger than the number of cores you're using. It's a little complicated, um, uh, but but honestly, it's not too bad. And if you just look at the cluster you're using, take the number of nodes, multiply that by the number of cores per node, uh, that's your number of cores, and multiply that by 20 or 30, that gives you a good number to go with. Um, that one is not as hard to communicate. This one seems to always trick people up every time I talk to them. And and I, I've also tried to go with this, you know, setting it to a small number. But I've actually come up with a new mnemonic that, or maybe not mnemonic, but a new uh, um, rule of thumb that I've been communicating more often, which is that um, if you took the entire amount of data coming in to Zing and multiplied it by this number, it should equal about 100,000 records. It should equal about 100,000. Um, that's completely experimental. It's kind of what I've seen. But if you are, if you're only going on about 100,000 records and that's your total data size, you don't really need to set this less than one, in my experience. If you're doing about a million records in, maybe set it to 0.1. If you're doing 10 million records in, maybe set it to 0 0.01. Um, and in each case, what Zing will be doing is is multiply is is taking that sample size or that sample time times the total input and generating a a uh, set of data to build its blocking from. And um, and I think about 100,000 seems to be a good number. So that's how I communicate it now, and that's been going over a lot better. I'm not sure if that helps anyone in the audience today, but um, but that seems to be about right. Um, and and then you know I have places to to set those numbers. Um, I have some helper functions which you're totally free to look at, um, including some stuff that using IPy widgets. But uh, I usually hide the code just because it's not very pretty. I'm not really a developer. I just pretend to be one. And uh, and then we get finally into the fun stuff, which is the the running step. Um, and and I guess so. If any questions do come up, please stop me again in case I'm missing something in the chat. I'm not able to see that. Um, so the again, the loop has three steps. First, we want to find the interesting pairs to label. Find, let Zing find the edge cases. And so you run find training data. And, and I, I make sure I tell customers and people using it and POCing that it's really important for this loop to be fast. You want to be able to get through this entire loop, part one, part two, part three, and then back to part one. You want to be able to do that in like less than 10 minutes. Um, because you're going to do it a bunch of times. Um, you're probably going to do it 10 or so times. Uh, and so you don't want it to take hours. Um, that was a mistake I made early on. But uh, in this case, it's you know the with an appropriately sized label data sample size, this goes pretty quick. Um, just need to run this guy again. Go back up here. So you run part two, and part two will now use IPy widgets to build a kind of quasi labeling interface. Um, and it it's, looks very similar to one of the blogs I showed earlier. And so you can start going through and, and actually asking people to label for you or label yourself. So Mary Burris and Alexander and Mary Burris and Album Albemarle, I'll say no. Uh, Charlie Ward and Elizabeth City and Charles Ward and Clayton, you can say no. And you know I won't go through all of them, but uh, but if we there are going to be some here. Dyrell Huddle and Elizabeth City, but with all sorts of mistakes. That's a good one. So you can. Label that one a match, and this becomes kind of just a real simple interface that you can either outsource to um, to a labeler who feels like they're having an input into training the the model, or just label through real quick. And if you've used Zing, you know that you get about fifteen to twenty or so um, each time you run it. Um, and I really I really like the idea of running it and then labeling those, and then saving those labels. So only doing fifteen or twenty at a time. I um, have gotten the question frequently, which is to say, well, I'd rather just label 100 or 200 at a time. And I tell people, OK, like you can do that. But I think you're not really taking full advantage of the active learning loop here. Uh, because each time you run part one again, Zing, from my understanding, is going to find new edge cases. It's going to try to be more intelligent the second time around. And if you are willing to label smaller chunks, but multiple smaller chunks, I believe the, you should you should get to a better uh, blocking strategy uh, faster um, with fewer labels. Um, so that's that's usually how I communicate to customers to really embrace the small training iteration loop. Really lean into the fact that this should be just a couple of minutes, and within two hours you could have a couple hundred really high quality labels. Um, 
but you just go through a couple times and once you've labeled i don't know 30 or 40 matches um that used to be the rule of thumb back in the day you know around 30 or 40 matches and around 30 or 40 non matches uh you can move on to the next step um any questions or comments i think we've kind of kind of reaching the end of the notebook um have maybe just one or two more things to show and then i have an optional notebook to show next in case anyone's interested but um a very short one okay please please write in questions and and sonal will stop me if anyone has any thoughts or questions here but uh, the next step obviously is to run the train and or train match steps the train is where zing is going to learn from all the labels and build a, um, a binary classifier um, or I believe it's binary classifier, but a classification tree to start understanding if things are matches or not. And then the match step is going to be where Zing uses that that model to actually deduplicate and, and cluster with transitive links um, down to uh, down to how all the data is related. Um, so you run that and that can take a while. We're properly taking advantage of, of Spark, uh, Spark cluster here. Uh, and so I think I, I just noticed this morning that um, Sunnel's put on some pretty good uh, numbers um, of like how long it might take or how big a cluster you might need for different sizes, including up to 80 million or something. So um, that's really where you really want Spark. This is for this step. This is the first big step where we're doing like really big distributed processing and, and Spark can shine through here. Uh, and then we get to look at the results. And um, I usually get a lot of uh, questions here, or a lot of interest into into what these numbers mean, and um, I don't talk about them that much, to be honest. I, I know what they mean, but um, I, I really just say to for the purposes of a POC, really focus on just the clustering and um, and look for how things are related. And if anyone, you know, we could talk about these today, but again, today is not really to educate about Zing. Today is really just to kind of show the the workflow. Um, and I just today noticed that there's this generate docs option. So I just threw that in this morning. I think it's super cool. Um, you can definitely do that um, and kind of show all the labels that people have put in in case you wanted to review the labels and kind of understand the something to do with how Zing is scoring things. Um, but in full disclosure, I haven't really given too much thought to this step yet. So that is uh, the... That is the main notebook. I, I do down here talk about the link phase for if someone wants to do more of that incremental approach or if they are really interested in linking data rather than doing deduplication. Um, but in this step, I usually I just take that exact same data. I break it into a 1% and a 99% sample um, and I match one against the other using the existing model. So I think that's all I'm going to say on this one, but, but you're free to extend this however you see fit and to start thinking about um, about these, um, how it works. So that's that's the end of this notebook. Um, I do feel very confident that uh, customers and anyone using um, this kind of interface can get to a pretty good result in just a couple of days, um, maybe a week. And um, and then I, of course there's many ways to go from here. But uh, but I, you know it's, it's 12:40 and I know we don't have forever, so. Um, I'll I'll stop there. I'll 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 highlight that if anyone is interested, I have another notebook I've been working on, which is specifically on understanding how clusters change with time. Um, so, like for example, and oops, how do I hide this? I got the dreaded screen at the top. Oh, here we go. Um, how these things change with time. Um, like if new data comes in or if data gets deleted or um, if IDs change, you know, how how do you notice if you have a million of these or 10 million of these and only 0.01% of them change in some fashion? How do you identify those changes? Um, because maybe the changes are good. Maybe the changes are bad. You don't know. And so I have a uh, an approach that I've been working on. I still consider it kind of like a beta approach, but the whole point is to um, generate a function called generate cluster diffs that takes as input um, and a, a, a two different clustering approaches, like maybe the before and the after, um, and then two IDs, the record identifier and the cluster identifier, and then report um, in the form of five data frames, a tuple of five data frames, kind of five different potential outcomes. And those are here, and I'll stop with these five sentences. Um, records that exist only in the first cluster mapping, so maybe records that got deleted, records that exist only in the second cluster mapping, so maybe records that are new, 
um, clusters that are identical. So clusters that have the exact same records, but maybe the cluster ID has changed for some reason. Uh, and then clusters from set one that have split into more than one cluster from set two. And the inverse, clusters from set two that are a combination of more than one cluster from set one. So you might imagine that as um, you know, two independent clusters. Maybe there were previously two clusters that represented the Luke Bilbro cluster, and then a new record comes in, and it's the linchpin that links those two clusters together. And so the second time you cluster, they all collapse into one. So that would be this fifth one here. Um, uh, and and you could have the inverse as well in theory. So um, that's this sort of thing. I have some examples, and this this notebook is something I'm happy to share as well. But um, but as promised, I'm going to stop, and uh, we can just open it up for discussion. Um, but uh, but happy to chat about things, and if anybody has Databricks questions, happy to answer those. But again, I'm not trying to to sell anybody on Databricks today. So I'll uh, I'll stop there, stop sharing, and um, open up the floor. Back to you, Sunil, for now, I guess. Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, so thank you so much uh, for this uh, <laughs> for this nice uh, I would say it's nice zinc program. Uh, I we we've really come a long way from the days we were doing those Spark Summit jobs with the zinc jar to a full fledged Python API, which is I think a full uh, entity resolution uh, program is not more than hundred lines now, and um, it's kudos to you for you know. Uh, clearing up so many things and uh, making it as simple as it is. So thank you for that. Um, yeah. Abhishek, has, Abhishek has one question here, which is records having match will have the same Z cluster. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, yeah, so that that would be a, that would be a yes. Yeah. So so uh, the oh, go ahead, Abhishek. Yeah, because I saw three columns there and then you said like mostly of the column which is interested the user is in the jet cluster. So technically in the final, I can group by on the cluster ID and get all the duplicates, correct? Uh, which That's has correct. been identified. Okay. That's correct. As as long as you're willing to accept that there's a transitivity that's ha that's taking place. And so okay. um, if, if A matches B and B matches C, A, B, and C will all be given the same ID, even if A okay. and C didn't match directly. Um, so there's a transitive closure is, is what it's often referred to. And so maybe A and Z weren't explicitly identified as a match, but transitively they were identified as a match, which is often what you want in this situation. But yes, yes. grouping by that ID is how you would maybe go build a golden record or something like that. Okay. And then there's a the question also, um, Abhishek, yes, of course you can have access. It's a completely open thing. Um, if you are on... Uh, I assume everybody is on the uh, Zing Slack, so I'll I'll post it yes. there again. I'll post both of them there again. I'll go to the I don't know. Sonal will tell me which channel is best uh, for it, and I'll I'll post both notebooks there. Um, if uh, I'll also put my email in the chat here, so if anyone needs to reach out to me for whatever reason, I can send it to you that way too. Um, but yeah, this is not meant to be any sort of like private thing. It's completely open. Uh, and you're welcome to use it. I mean, there's like an open Databricks license with it, but like our open Databricks license is like, yeah, just have fun with it, right? Just don't, just don't say that we cheated you or something. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mayur has a question too, I guess. Yeah. Yes, Mayur. Hey. Uh, yes. Thanks, Sonal. Uh, hey, Luke. Uh, it's really great presentation. Uh, so there are a couple of things uh, you mentioned about like uh, when we iterate the data, right? Uh, it might uh, that might change the clusters, right? Uh, maybe that could be the case. So, uh, is there any uh, like any particular number of records, or de totally depends on the data? Uh, if uh, completely new data, we are training our clusters on, then is it like you see like a lot of changes uh, on their clusters, or how how these things? Uh, is there like maybe this is kind of a black box for me? Yeah, you know the the answer is it's hard to answer that in general, but I can tell you that in in practice there are some common patterns, um, mm -hmm. and so uh, usually the daily changes that come in, the, the like the the way that data changes with time is mostly appends. It's mostly new records. Um, mm -hmm. There will be updates applied to records, but that's usually a smaller amount 
that's what's in and updates are changes to existing records uh, and there will be some deletes but i would say appends are by far and away the most common type of change to these systems probably like a 10 to 1 like 10 times as many appends than updates and a, appends don't really change clustering that much usually they rarely change clustering other than creating new clusters if there are new records that have never been seen before. And so of those five types of output that I showed in that cluster diff where they, there's the, the ones where records disappeared, the ones where records appeared, the ones where clusters stay the same, and then how clusters changed, the most common by far is the second one where or the one that's uh, for a new record showing up. That is without a doubt the most common, and that's pretty easy to handle actually. It's either going to generate a new cluster because you've never seen it before, or it's going to fit into an existing cluster. And I would say 90% of changes probably fit into that bucket. Um, the other 10% are all, it's, it's kind of a mix. It really depends on how your data changes. Um, updates, you know, things, things can change. Um, or maybe a month or two later, you retrain the model and it gets better. Like you've you've labeled better data, or you've you've pulled out some some bad labels from before, and your clustering has gotten smarter, and that can change your clustering, and that can change it. You know, you could see a couple percent change, but um, but if you have a couple million, you know, you could be tens of thousands of of clusters that are changing each time. So it's uh it's it's significant. It's technically human scale, but it is not easy human scale. So I think it's good to try to automate the ones you can. Um, the ones that, you know, it's a, it's an ad, automate it. Deletes, automate it. Same cluster, just different cluster ID, automate it. Um, and then the ones where clusters have changed, you know, the thousand or so each week, you know, push that downstream to a process to handle that in a more manual approach. Mm -hmm. So is there any standard practice to evaluate that models? Um, like, like, val like, like measure the accuracy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's um actually someone and I were just chatting about this this morning. I think we've talked about this a lot. Uh, there's precision and recall are the most common approaches. Um, but with precision and recall in this type of approach, there's actually two forms. There is because um, you're you're labeling data. A human is going in and labeling data, and then you're building clusters at the end. And so the model can run. The Zing model can can be built. And then, in theory, I don't. This doesn't. I don't think this exists yet. But we were just chat, chatting about this. You you could ask for to ask how accurate Zing was at reproducing the labels, and you could look for false positives and false negatives on that, and that would give you a precision and recall score. But that precision and recall is not the same as precision and recall in the clusters. Um, the final output, as you as we saw, were those Z cluster IDs and records, and so. How do you measure precision and recall of clusters? It's an interesting question. I do have some some approaches, and I think I put it in the solution accelerator. I do have some suggestions. Um, I'll 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 double check and I'll put it in the um, in the Zing Slack channel later. But there are some there are some kind of ideas of how you might measure cluster accuracy. Um, uh, I, I, in general, think there's two there's two generic approaches, though. One is with ground truth. If you just have someone who is kind of accumulated tr like true data and you can compare the two, that gives you uh, an accuracy. Or if you can do like a random sampling of the results. So maybe randomly select 100 clusters and have someone review those 100 clusters manually, um, then you can do like a statistical inference of what the the, the overall statistics of the, the global population are as well. So those are the kind of the two generic approaches that people would use, but like applying those in practice can be pretty com complicated. Um, I, I, I Hopefully that made sense. There's a lot of words there. Yeah, 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 I got it. So uh, with the data breaks, how can we, uh like standardize this uh, in the job flow uh like with the new incremental data is there any any uh, documents or something steps available yeah i mean so that was I, I i worry about that one because that was what we tried to do in this story um in this story which you which you can i'll put all these links again in the chat but in this story we, we really thought hard about how would you actually build a workflow, an entire workflow where there's an initial step and an incremental step. And we talk explicitly, like, like all the stuff that's going to happen. We talk about how you would use the link step and, and how you would uh, perform the record linking. And then we talk about uh, even, even more here. Like, um, I think there's some pictures in here. Do we have pictures in here? 
we used to, I thought we had pictures in here. Well, we talk about kind of all of the, the steps that are, might be needed in order to incorporate these incremental matches. And, and honestly, it's a, it's a good thing to read through to understand the steps, but I do think it's, it's almost too in depth for a POC. Um, and so I, that's why I've, I've shifted. That's again, why I kind of shifted to this view, which is to say a POC is the same for everybody. Um, an incremental approach is going to use the link phase of Zing probably, um, but the way that it gets implemented is going to be so specific to the to that opportunity and that customer and what their use cases and requirements are that I don't know how to generalize it um, in a way that is that is going to work. But if you wanted to see my best approach, it would be this one. This is where we really thought for months and months, like what like what what are as many edge cases that we could think of that you would need to think about in these initial and incremental workflows, and that's that's where we put it all. So I'd like to yeah. add something here. Uh, for people who are like seriously looking at incremental flow, uh, that's something that we've actually built on the enterprise side, which is like you know a, a production workflow, because uh, a one-time match or a one-time link is is fine. You can have varying data sets, and uh, Zing Open Source gives you a lot of power and a lot of you know um, ability to uh, really master your data. But if you want to have a stream of updated records, deleted records, um, new records added, and you want to ensure that cluster IDs are preserved in the right way when clusters merge, the largest cluster's ID gets picked up, when clusters uh, split, uh, uh, those thing ID is uh, provided in a way that makes sense uh, based on the size of the cluster, uh, et cetera. Um, so, so those are things that we've actually added as part of the Zing Enterprise. So you may want to take a look at uh, that. Um, the the way the solution notebooks uh, that uh, Luke and uh, us we've worked on are for you to be able to kind of you know walk through all these phases to get to results uh, quickly. But if your need is like you know you want uh, an updated cluster the Golden records coming in, um, I'm streaming them to different uh, applications, having a matching run incrementally every hour or two hours. Uh, maybe Zing Enterprise is something that you would like to look at. That makes a lot of sense from my point of view. Yeah, I mean, I think I think what we learned was that it was probably a little too challenging to do on our own with with just cobbling together open source. So kind of putting that managed layer together, I think, is Makes a lot of sense. That's probably what I would actually say. If you yeah. need, if you need that regularity, I would say go to Sonal. She's the expert. She knows how to do it right, and and that's not where I am. Yeah. And uh, uh, just just between this close group, you know, honestly, when I wrote uh, Zing, uh, I thought it would be the toughest thing I would ever write uh, in my life. <laughs> and I was like, let me just see uh, open sourcing and you know um, helping other people because it was really tough to put put, uh, put together. But when I wrote incremental, it was like, you know, uh, it was far more complex than, any, than anything else that we've uh, done in the open source. So yes, I would agree with Luke there that uh, it is definitely a complex piece uh, to keep those clusters managed. Yeah, just some 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 inside baseball for my side. When I was at Tamer, they had to build an entire second product to do incremental matching, um, which which was a huge headache. Um, so uh, yeah, it's it's hard. <laughs> it is hard. <laughs> yeah, it is hard. Um, I think I well, also yeah sure. Oh, I was gonna say just just I think we're yeah probably at the end. So I just wanted to thank thank you guys for the questions and attention. Um, would be happy to chat with anyone if they have specific questions, but I will I'll make sure all of my stuff gets put on to the Zing Slack. You, my emails in the chat, reach out directly, feel free. Um, I won't bite, I promise. So um, happy to talk about open source stuff. Yes, it was uh, great fun seeing this. And um, I, I, as, as I said earlier, it's we've come a long way uh, from the early Spark Summit jobs that we were running to somehow, you know, uh, getting to work with Databricks. And this looks really cool. So I really hope a lot more people will be tempted to try it and, and see the real benefits on their own data. So do we have any further questions? Yeah. Yeah, You're welcome. 
Right. Uh, then thank you so much, uh, Luke, for this uh, very engaging um, open discussion. And I'm sure we all are waiting to hear, uh, you know, from you about uh, uh, the the sharing of the notebooks. And um, I hope some people will also reach out to you directly or to me, uh, whichever way works for people. And uh, looking forward to having more of these discussions. Sounds good. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great, it's a great progress. So. All right, everyone. Have a good Bye. rest of the week. Bye.